Amen. So, once again, very good morning. And uh, today, what we will study together, so I discontinued the teaching that we were doing, the series. We will continue next Sunday so that today we can talk about uh, women, the place women occupy, even occupied in the ministry and in the life of uh, Jesus. Because Jesus is uh, our gold standard. Anyone who came before Jesus, they did their best to represent uh, Christ. But many times uh, the culture kind of suppressed uh, women. And when you read even the Old Testament, there are so many cultural things that are happening but that are recorded. It is not that God approved of it. God, like he said in the book of Acts and the Apostles, he winked at it, he overlooked it. As long as women were not complaining, God kept quiet. But whenever women came and asked, he said, that was never my intention. And we truly need to portray the true heart of Christ concerning the, the place of uh, women in uh, the ministry of Jesus, in the life of Jesus, in the church, in the society. How does God see women and how does he treat uh, women? Men. And uh, it is an exhaustive study which you will not be able to expound and do justice to it. But today we will succinctly look at the few points to put us on the right direction so that when you at home, you are talking to your sons and you are talking to your daughters, then uh, you can teach them the right understanding of the Bible. That's why in the synagogue, for those of you who watched prayer Storm on Friday, I explained how the synagogue works. The synagogue means house of prayer. And in the house of prayer, there's a house of study. And men and women were always studying the in the same place. Of course, the walls of partition, not because uh, God did not uh, want women to be in front. So you see, you need to put yourself in the shoes of the people of the days. Men were in front. And then boys from uh, four and a half to 12, the year to 11, the year of Amitra, were the second uh, quarter. So there was a, like a step always that goes down. So the, from five ish to 11, they were the boys' quarter. And then at the back, there was another step, were women and uh, children. Not because they were inferior. Are you with me? Because if Lulu, for instance, when Jesse was a baby, wanted to breastfeed, will Lulu feel comfortable sitting beside the man that is a stranger and open the breast being breastfeeding? No. But will she be comfortable breastfeeding among other women? Yes. Will, will she be comfortable breastfeeding in front of a two or a three year old child? There's not a problem. So that's for that reason to keep the dignity of uh, women. That's why they put them at the back so that uh, 
men will not look at the other side. Even in Europe, most of the time, when there used to be that chivalry, when you are walking with a woman and she's supposed to take the stairs, the man needs to go in front so that he will not be peeping through her skirt. So it's the same principle. But unfortunately, and learned people of the 21st century, when they're ready, they say, no, women are inferior to men. The design of the temple was uh, made in that way so that uh, even if the child is crying at the back, the mom can be trying to breastfeed or do whatever without disturbing the whole uh, service. That's why there were different uh, courts in the synagogue. Whatever God does, he can explain to you why I'm doing that way. So, Christ, Jesus, always uh, lifted up uh, women in his life and in his uh, ministry, regardless of the background of those men, of those women also, he always lifted the people that were in contact with him and he was never ashamed to be associated with someone based on their background. And that should be the heart of the church. You know, some of us, even when we are Catholic, the Catholic did a wonderful uh, job. Whatever we may think, they did a wonderful uh, job. There were some things that we used to do. That when they came, you know, for instance, in Africa, back then, if you had twins, it used to be considered as uh, evil. And those children, they are going to kill them. So who stopped that uh, practice? Christians. Are you with me? So regardless of what we may think, the little light of the gospel that they brought stopped the lots of atrocities that were happening. Do you know in Africa also, if you had a child that you had um, uh, it was albino, you know the condition of albino, no melanin in the skin, they would kill that child. Even up to today in some Muslim countries, they think if you kill that child, you eat its flesh, you have power. So when they say an albino, they want to kill it, to kill that child. Who stopped that? Christianity. That little Catholic uh, preaching is taught a lot of evil things uh, that the people were uh, doing. In my country, in the north, there is a tribe, for instance, still up to today, before they give you the wife or the daughter in marriage, the father will sleep with the daughter, the brother will sleep with the daughter. So, but, you see, but it is a thing that is rooted in witchcraft. But who stopped all those uh, practices? When people now gave their life to Christ, they stopped it. In Gabon, in the uh, Republic of Central Africa, and in Chad, those are tribes that they call the Fon. The Fon, they are cannibalists. Even in, Latin, um, in Mexico, there are still also some Aztec, they are cannibalists. They eat, uh, you know, when I went to Tanzania, there's a tribe, they still eat uh, people, not in the spirit. Physically, they will kill you, they will eat you, cook you well, put you in a barrel so that your skin is going to peel, and then they will eat you. So when I went there and led them to Christ, two of those women that are the head of that uh, clan gave their life to Christ. Christianity stopped a lot of evil things. 
But even when we talk about Catholicism, they did a great job. We are not as darkness as our four others. So when we come in the West, we see some of the things that are shocking us. We should always have mercy and compassion because the people don't know the left from the right. The same way also our grandfathers did not know the left from the right. Why am I saying this? Because God has called us in Europe. As unless we want to make a Christianity a cloth, like the Jews ended up making Judaism a cloth. The Jews were Syrians. And because God gave them some light, they thought now they were better than where they came from. And they kept Judaism for them. So that's why God had to start now with Christianity. And we also, if we are not very careful, we are going to keep Christianity to ourselves. When you come to this country, you are going to see people with tattoos all over the face, all over the body. You should not cringe when you are looking at them. Your heart should be weeping deep inside out of compassion to minister to them. You're going to see a lot of things in families a year. And if God has called us to witness to this land, we need to prepare our hearts. Because once upon a time, our ancestors also, when they did not know Christ, they were like that. My grandfather married the twin sisters, my grandmother and her twin sisters, plus four other women. So, a lot of things were happening because they did not know the left from the right. But regardless of our past, Christ is not ashamed of our past. That's why I always talk about my family. Because we all have a messy family, but thank God we have found Christ. Now, point number one, the way Christ looked at uh, women in his life and in his ministry, point number one, Christ is proud of his lineage. Christ is proud of his lineage or of his genealogy. Many people, when they make it in life, they want to edit out many names from the genealogy. Do not edit people from your genealogy. It is a testimony that will help other people. My grandfather was a warlock. Yes. My grandmother also was a witch. But she gave her life to Christ before dying. We all come from uh, a background. And in Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy or the lineage of Jesus uh, is uh, listed for us. It shows that there is hope for all of us. Regardless of the family we come from, there is a hope for all of us. The lineage of Jesus is uh, recorded. And if there are four women uh, who are listed in the lineage of Jesus. The first one is Tamar. Tamar, she did something that the Bible forbids to do. She played like a hooker. She stood in the corner to trick her father-in-law and she became pregnant. Are you with me? But because she decided to join the family of Jacob, go 
God also still blessed her and blessed her, her children, Perez and uh, Zerah. And Perez, Jesus came from that lineage of uh, Perez. So Jesus is not ashamed to mention in his genealogy this was some of the people that were in my family. And now they are in heaven. Tamar is in heaven. People change. People change. There is a hope for everybody. The second woman that is mentioned is Ruth. Ruth is a Moabitess. Now, do you know how the, the Ammonites and the Moabites came to be? It was an incest. Lot slept with his two daughters and gave birth to two sons, Moab and uh, Ammon. You are going to see lots of incest in this land. Whenever people do not have Christ, there is always an incest. In my country, there are lots of incest. Our neighbor, Rabbi Nova back home, impregnated his uh, three of his uh, daughters. So he was at the same time the father and the grandfather of uh, the children. Because they did not have uh, Christ. But when we surrender our life to Christ, regardless of that past, he receives us uh, in uh, his kingdom. All of us. And Boaz, Ruth, became uh, a widow. She was married to Marlon in Ruth chapter 4, verse 10, and the husband uh, died. So even when you are a widow, God still has a bright. Uh, future for you, provided you come to uh, Christ. The game changer in the life of anybody is whenever they receive uh, Christ. It is a game changer. And when she received Christ, she was in abject poverty. She was uh, a widow. But God lifted her out of her poverty. God gave her a husband and she became the grandmother of David. She gave birth to Obed. Obed gave birth to Jesse, even the great-grandmother, and Jesse gave birth to David. So something kingly, something royal, can come out of a shattered life. Are you with me? The heart of God is always close to those who are of a contrite spirit, those that are the downcasts. Whenever people, God sees that people are being mistreated, God always comes out of the rescue, provided they surrender to Jesus and Ruth abandoned the God of the Moabites. She said to Naomi, Your God is going to be now my God. She abandoned the people who are idol worshippers and she said, Your people are going to be my people. That is what changed her entire destiny and she found her name now in the book of the genealogy of Jesus. We have Rahab in the book of Joshua. And she was living promiscuously as a prostitute, but she received the, the spies. And she tied up a scarlet rope signifying the blood of uh, Jesus. She was washed away by the blood of Jesus. The entire family 
also was a saint because of her decision to receive uh, Christ. And she married the son of Judah. She's also in the genealogy of uh, Jesus. Your life will change. The life of anybody will change uh, if only they surrender to Christ. We have Bathsheba. Bathsheba, it was not a love story. Bathsheba was raped by David. So the story started as a drama. A really nightmare. She was raped by David. David murdered his husband to cover up the story. And because God is always defending those that are being treated unfairly, God made sure that it is her son that is going to be the king. So when you are a Christian, you need to know the heart of God. And then a bit of mistreat you, start smiling, start laughing, because God is setting you up for promotion. Because our God is a God of justice. Whenever he sees injustice, he comes and he corrects it. He made sure that none of the other sons of David could be king except the son of Bathsheba because David did her wrong. And God was the God of justice intervened. And then we have Mary. Here she was betrothed and engaged and she found herself now pregnant before the marriage was consummated. Yet, she was blessed among all the women. And the son Jesus was the Holy One of Israel. We should always remember that whatsoever the background of the people is, they are accepted in the beloved. That is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. They are accepted. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. So, Jesus was not ashamed to, to tell us, this is my background. These are the people in my family. Can you have a family as messed up as the family of Jesus, as the genealogy of Jesus? But, they are all in heaven. Christ will always do justice for all women, for he sees how they have been unfairly treated. In the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22, Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22 says, for the Lord is our church. So, the Lord your God is our church. If anyone does you evil, don't worry. Your God who is the church will intervene in your favor. For God is our judge. He's also our law giver. And he's our king. And he will save us. He will save us. So he's our judge, and the foundation of God's throne are righteousness and uh, judgment. God becomes the husband of the widow and the father of the fatherless. He's the defender of the widows and of all who are oppressed. That's why as soon as a roof as a widow surrendered to Christ, God made sure that he defended her, he prospered her, and in the process also found her a husband if she wanted to be married. Now, in the book of uh, Psalm 68, verse 5 to verse 6, Psalm 50, 68, sorry, verse 5 to verse 6, 
the Bible says, uh, a father of the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. And it goes on to say, God sets the solitary in uh, families. And he was uh, both isolated in a foreign land, and God set her in a family. Be it a spiritual family or a biological family, God will set you in a family. I've known this principle for a long time. Any country I have lived in, any city I have moved in, God had always, because I, I, I knew nobody in those cities, God always put me with a family that uh, became like a biological family. And it is a promise uh, of God that even if your parents are no longer around, God will send you father figures, mother figures, because God knows you have that need, that emotional need. So you set the solitary in uh, families. He brings out those who are bound uh, into prosperity. So, Ruth, that was bound by poverty, God brought her into prosperity. But the rebellious dwell in the dry uh, land. So we need to know the promises of God uh, when we are praying. He's our defender. He will set you, if you are solitary, he's going to set you in uh, families. He did that for Ruth, he did that for Mary, he did that for Rahab, and all the women that were in the genealogy of uh, Jesus. Point number two, Christ does not discriminate against the women. Actually, if people knew the Bible and applied it, they would realize that there is no discrimination between genders in the eyes of God. The Bible says male and female created them in his image. It is not just the man that is in the image of God. Male and female are in the image of God. It is the same spirit of God that is inside a man that is also inside a woman. That's the first thing that we need to know. Then, as our law giver and our judge, God treats the two genders equally. He's not partial towards men when it's come to his judgments. When we look at John chapter 8, from verse 1 to verse 12, for instance, John chapter 8, from verse 1 to verse 12, the Pharisees that were being uh, partial when it came to judgment, they said they caught that woman in the very act of adultery. And they brought her before Jesus. And they said, Jesus, Moses told us that uh, she should be stoned to death. Jesus says, no, you are being partial. They were to, to commit that sin. There are two people. Why will you stone the woman and not stone the man? So if you extend the mercy to the man that you did not stone him to death, you did not condemn him, he said to the woman, neither do I condemn you either. And he says to those men, if there is anyone that is without any sin here, 
letting be the first to cast a stone. So you see, there is no double standard with uh, Jesus. The same demand he has on men is the same demand he has on uh, women. So if you show mercy to one, you need to show mercy to the other. In the book of Hosea chapter 4, verse 14, Hosea chapter 4, verse 14, this is what God says. God says, I will not punish your daughters when they commit harlotry, nor your bride when they commit adultery. Why? For the men themselves go apart with the harlots and offer sacrifice with the rich of the harlots. Therefore, people who do not understand will be trampled. The men in Israel came to God. God do need to punish the women because they are being unfaithful. God says, no, I will not. Are you not also the men doing the same thing? God does not have uh, different scales for women and for men. He has the same uh, scale. If he forgave the men, he also forgives uh, the wives and the daughters. We abide by the same uh, standard. Men and uh, women. And when it comes to inheritance, because the Jewish tradition, because it used to be a patriarchal society, they never gave an inheritance to women, to daughters. So one of the sons of Manasseh only had daughters. He tried hard to have a war. Seven all came only women, and then he died. So when they were partitioning the land, Moses the great, sometimes you need to challenge your pastor. Because sometimes what your pastor is teaching you is the tradition of a man, which is uh, making the word of God of no effect and keeping people uh, in bondage. They said, no, Moses, with all due respect, we think it is unfair. We are in Numbers chapter 27, 6 to 7. Numbers 27, 6 to 7. They said to Moses, so you mean because our father did not have any son, so we will not have any inheritance? That's unfair. That's unfair. Go talk again to God. You see, you need some time to speak, even if it is the pastor who's telling you nonsense. Say, no, go talk again to God. And he went and talked to God. God says, yes, you are supposed to give the inheritance to women as well. The same way you give to men, to your boys. So Moses came down. I said, this is what God said. We should give the same inheritance to daughters. Then the man said, but if we give them the inheritance, when they are going to marry, the land is going to be added to the tribe of the man. Now, men decided to put another law on those women and said to them, okay, do you agree to only marry in our tribe your cousins? And they were also looking for marriage. Of course, we want to be married as well. So they married the cousins so that the inheritance can stay. So that's why you see in India, in Africa, people marry cousins, even among the royal family, they are all cousins getting married. It started because of the inheritance. They are all afraid that the land and the money is going to go to someone who is not part of the 
And that's why they kept on marrying her one and another. It is a noble thing because people were afraid to give inheritance to women. God solved the problem, but uh, they still couldn't uh, believe. Now, today, in this 21st century, if you are a mother or a father or a couple, you have uh, sons and you have uh, daughters and you have a lot of uh, land or a lot of properties. How do you solve it? Because uh, there are no new problems on earth, just new people facing the same old uh, problem. Are you with me? How, how do you do that? You take all your properties, uh, you put it in what they call a trust. So the property does not belong to your daughter per se. It belongs to the trust. And uh, your daughter is uh, one of uh, the director of that trust. She cannot sell that the house or that plot of land. And her husband has no right uh, over that land because it is he's not one of the beneficiary of uh, the trust. So even if he divorces, uh, if he came with evil intention to marry your daughter because he wanted uh, the money, he will leave with the money that he brought in uh, the relationship. That's how you protect uh, your children. It is an old problem more than 3,000 years, uh, and just new method of protecting the women from uh, men who have no genuine uh, intentions. And you also can protect your own sons as well, because some women also would want to marry your sons because of uh, Yes. Pardon? Put all your things already in the trust before you marry that foolish man. If you cannot trust him, yes. If you cannot trust him, my advice is don't marry him. <laughs> if you still want to go ahead, put all your belongings into a trust. And uh, put yourself just as a director of the trust, not a beneficiary, and your children as a beneficiary. So, if he wants to leave, he's going to leave with the money that uh, he came in, or you built her together. But God wants the daughters to get uh, the same inheritance. If you have a son and a daughter, you split it into 50, 50. That is the heart uh, of God. And my prayer is that we will not uh, rob uh, women of the spiritual inheritance, physical inheritance, and material uh, inheritance uh, in the name of uh, Jesus. That we will do things the right uh, way. The beauty of the ministry of Jesus is that the people who have been forgiven much they end up loving Jesus uh, much and serving Jesus uh, much. People that, if you look at a lot of great people that were mightily used by God, they always had a painful past, a dramatic past. That's why when they received Christ, they were so grateful. But people that are already, that's why lots of pastors' children don't do great things. Because they were always born around Christianity. They took it for granted. In the book of Luke, chapter 7, verse 36 to verse 50. Luke chapter 7, verse 36 to verse 50. Jesus went into the house of Simon the leper. Himself he had leprosy. That's why they called him Simon the leper. He had leprosy and Jesus healed him of leprosy. But he's judging another person who used to live 
in promiscuity. And he said to Jesus, if Jesus were a prophet, he would not even allow her to touch him. We need to allow people close to us, regardless of their background. Many times I used to go sitting on some people's streets, and I would sit with those drug dealers. And even the homeless, they are shooting the drugs. I was sitting with them with my suit on the floor. I would pull the car and go, and I would be talking to them. You should not be afraid that people have feel that they are, how drunk they are. When you show them that you are not afraid of them, they're not ashamed of being associated with them, it shows them that you love them. And they gradually are going to start changing uh, their life. And uh, she has abandoned her life of promiscuity. And she was sitting behind Jesus, someone who gave herself uh, worth. And she was weeping with her tears, wiping, cleaning, washing the feet of Jesus. And with her long hair, she was cleaning uh, the feet of Jesus. She took one of her uh, alabaster perfume. It cost about 300 uh, denarii. That's a year wage. 12 hours a shift for a whole year, every six days a week. That's about 18,000 pounds of the day, just a perfume. And she got that money through prostitution. She said, I no longer need that money. I found someone who has given me self worth. So she took the alabaster, broke it, and anointed the feet of the Jesus. And uh, Simon, who used to be a member, was uh, indignant in his heart. What is that nonsense? She should not even be among us. And sometimes when we come to church, we see some people we feel like no. They should not be even be in church. Everybody should be in church, regardless of the past, regardless of their addictions. Churches or hospital. You come and you get healed spiritually, physically, and emotionally. And uh, she was kissing the feet of Jesus. And Jesus said to Simon, Simon, I came into your house. You did not even give me water to wash my feet. You did not even kiss me to show that you have affection for me. But look at this one. Since I came to your house, she has not ceased to kiss in my feet. The true face, the one that is forgiven much, loves her much. The one that thinks that she has been forgiven a little, loves a little. That's why even for the gospel, those who are highly educated, God does not use their mouth a lot. Because they think they are doing God a service. God took me away from my university job. I am an asset for the kingdom. God will never use your mighty. But fishermen that say, glory to God. It's a privilege. And God is going to use them. Paul was highly educated. He had to change his way of thinking. He had to consider whatever was his personal achievement, academic achievement, as a rubbish for God to be able to use. Because with education, knowledge of self, you become arrogant. The more you know, the more arrogant you become. And God resists the time he knows the arrogant from afar. So, if you have a lot of education, that's why also it is hard for those who trust in riches uh, to enter the kingdom. So Jesus said, it is hard for those who are rich to enter the kingdom. And he says, so who can enter? He said, no, 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 it is not about the money. It is the trust. The trust is not in God. The trust is in their money. So it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man. Eh? To enter the kingdom because he doesn't want to trust God. He knows that I have lots of money. Uh, my trust is in my uh, 
money. Our trust should be in God. In the ministry of Jesus, women were the one giving the majority of the money. Let me tell you the truth. In church, it is women that give more money than men. I say it again. In church, it is women that give more money than men. So, in the book of Luke, chapter 8, from verse 1 to verse 3, Luke chapter 8, from verse 1 to verse 3, the Bible says that some of the women that Jesus ministered to drove out a demon out of them, healed them, forgave them of the life of sin. And the Bible says that they, certain women who had been healed of an evil spirit and infirmity, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom came out seven demons, Joanna, the wife of the Chusa, Herod's steward, Susanna, and many other women who provided for Jesus from their substance. So they provided for the ministry of Jesus. Jesus was not bringing money out of the mouth of the fish every day. He did it once in Matthew 17. All the other time, those wonderful women, and some men as well, but mainly a lot of women from the substance, they were giving into the treasury. And Judas Iscariot was helping himself, putting some of it in his pocket. So without those women, Jesus could not have spread the gospel. They were instrumental in the furtherance of the kingdom. And the truth of the matter is, even in my family, my mom always gave more than my dad. My dad, to, to have him give money to the pastor, my mom would force him, do you need to give uh, your tithe? He said, no. What will he do with that? So he's calculating his salary. He said, no, that's too much. But my mom would always give to my pastor. My mom would always uh, send him money. When my, my pastor, of blessed memory, he was in uh, DRC Congo, all his rent, it was my mom that was paying. All his suits, my mom that was buying it. All his shoes. When my mom would travel, my mom considered him as uh, her fourth son. As my mom would travel, he would buy also to my pastor the suit and the shoes. My mom always never wanted my pastor to beg. He said, you've sacrificed your life to help others, I will also make sure that you never beg. When my pastor would go to India, all the flight ticket, my mom was paying it. But I saw also something. The income of my mom was five times the income of my dad. Are you with me? The income of my mom was five times the income. God just created opportunities for her to be having money to be given to the kingdom. So, you cannot say no because I'm a man. God is going to bless me more. No, are you giving? You are not giving. So give, you shall be given unto you good measure, press down, shake it together. There's no gender, no favoritism with God. He treats women the same way he treats uh, men. Even when it comes to his message, in the book of Luke, chapter 24, from verse 9 to verse 12. Luke chapter 24, from verse 9 to verse 12. When Jesus rose from the dead, who was the first people to see him out of the dead, of the grave? Mary Magdalene. Out of whom he cast out seven demons. Not even his mother. It has nothing to because you are the mother of Jesus that you are going to see him first. No. 
If you are not waiting upon the Lord, He's not going to show up to you either. And who was he sent to preach the message of resurrection? Mary Magdalene. He said to her, Go tell Peter and my other disciples that I'm going to my father. He's also your father to my God. He's also the Lord. That message of resurrection, it was a woman that was sent to deliver it. Are you with me? So women can preach. Jesus sent Mary Magdalene to tell these apostles. In the book of John chapter 4, verse 27 to verse 29. John chapter 4, verse 27 to verse 29. We also see the woman that was at the well, a Samaritan. The disciples were saying, why are you talking to a woman? Because the real Pharisee would not even talk to the women. That was never the plan of God. How can women learn if you never talk to them? Jesus was ministering to women one on one. He would do that in public so that people can see there's nothing fishy going on. But he was ministering to women directly. They would ask a question, he will answer them whenever he could. And he sent her. She's the one who went and told everybody in the city, Come, I found a man who has told me everything about my life. Could it be the Messiah? And the whole town of Samaria came out to see if it was a soul. So he sent her as his uh, evangelist. So some churches, some, some, some pastor friend of mine, they fell off with me because uh, Lynn was ministering with me. One of them doing the healing crusade. They liked me, but they did not like Lynn. She's a woman. She cannot preach. She's a woman. She cannot lay hands on anybody. I say, well, in your church, that's the case. But here in the house of prayer for all nations, God uses the men as well as he uses the women. If the women have been praying and fasting, God is going to reveal themselves, himself to the women. The apostles, they fled. Only Mary Magdalene was there. She said, I'm not going anywhere. Where have you made my Lord? That's why God could use uh, Catherine Kuhlman, he could use uh, Maria of Heather and many other women. He could use Deborah. Deborah was the judge of Israel. God has no problem putting the woman uh, the head of the whole nation of Israel. He put Deborah as uh, the judge of Israel. We are the ones stumbling over that issue. God is not. And if we say, that no, in our church, we don't allow women to be pastors. You've put laws that God did not put on earth. And if you want to do that, God is going to close his eyes. Do you? But in my heart, I want women to minister as well as men. I want young people to minister. I told you before, even John was a 16. 16, when Jesus ordained him an apostle, he died at the hundred. So even young people have a voice. That's why I left the other church. They were telling me, you are too young, go preach in the children's church. And I was 27, I finished Bible college. You are looking, waiting for me to be 45, married with children, as I'm not waiting to be 45, I'm 27. So you mean I'm going to wait almost uh, 20 years of the Bible? Was it going with Yes. I'm not waiting. I need to go preach. Young people can be mightily used uh, by God. Women, elderly people. So may we change our way of uh, thinking uh, in Jesus' uh, name. Let us pray. Father, thank you. We give you all the glory, all the praise for all that you do. We pray that in this Mother's Day, you will teach us uh, 
how to see our sisters, our mothers, our daughters, because uh, they are equal to your sons. You have the same Holy Spirit. There is not the Holy Spirit for women, not the Holy Spirit for men. There is not the gift for men, the gift of the Spirit for men, and the gift of the Spirit for women. You give the same Holy Spirit, the same gift of the Spirit, the same adoption, and the same inheritance. Now, help us to change, to debunk all of our customs and cultures that are hindering the, the emancipation of women in uh, the society, in the church, in the careers. We pray that you do a mighty work in our life. And thank you for this Mother's Day. In Jesus' precious name, uh, amen. Man. Now, before we share the grace, uh, we have stopped to date the 28th, you can switch off, the 